Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julie Langen. I'm director at the Department of Historic Resources, and we consider ourselves very privileged to be partnering for a second year with Preservation Virginia on the Preservation Academy series. And I personally am very excited uh, to hear from our speakers today because I too encounter difficulties finding craftsmen qualified and experienced to work at my historic house. And if I can't find them, uh, I don't know how other people would find them. Uh, one thing I will say about um, locating experienced tradespeople is that we get calls every single day from the public asking us to make recommendations of people. And while we do maintain a list, we are forbidden to make recommendations. So just know that uh, we would help you if we could in that regard, but we're not the best source for recommendations. And admittedly, our list is very short um, because these people are, tradespeople are in short supply. So I'm really excited about today's topic. I'm especially looking forward to hearing about how Maryland has been responding to this challenge. And I just want to welcome all of you and turn it over to Elizabeth Castelny, CEO of Preservation Virginia. Thank you, Julie. Um, and I want to add my welcome to all of our participants today and also to our panelists. Thank you so much for giving of your time to be with us and um, to preparing your, your uh, remarks. I know we're all interested. Um, I also want to give a thanks to the Department of Historic Re Resources for their support and their collaboration over the 2023 series of educational offerings. Um, we're really grateful for our ongoing partnership on this pro educational programming and all that we do together with the department each and every day. We are also grateful to our sponsors, Peach Tree House Foundation, Daniel and Company, Monument Companies, Historic Richmond, and Commonwealth Advisors. And I also want to thank all of you who have registered uh, for this event. Your fees help underwrite this programming and our other educational and community engagement endeavors. Now, as ever, we've been all on Zooms and um, virtual programming for three years now, but a little housekeeping to make sure our time together is efficient. Um, we're gonna hold questions to the end, but you're certainly welcome to um, send us questions at any time via the Q&A box or the chat box. We'll be keeping track of the questions and we'll respond to as many as time allows at the end of the broadcast. You can turn on the closed caption um, by going to the bottom of this, the Zoom screen and locating the three dots that, um, that say more. You can click on captions and then show captions. Um, and I think Sonia will put those instructions in the chat box as well. This section is being recorded and we will um, you will receive a link in several days, and also that link will be posted on both our website and DHR's website. And I'm just like Julie. Here at Preservation Virginia, we receive phone calls from individuals, business owners, local governments, and community organizations asking the same questions. How do I find experienced tradespeople to undertake a restoration project? Do you know of a brick mason? Who can I call to repair our roof <laughs> in our exterior? And the questions go on. And frankly, even with having a skilled team of restoration specialists um, that we employ, there are times that we hire, we need to hire competent craftspeople to take on projects. So where do you find those people? How do you eval evaluate their skill sets to know if they're right for your project? And most importantly, how do we as a community um, gather together to train the next generation of craftspeople? Those are the, some of the questions we'll delve into today, but I think we'll all agree today's just a starting point. It's one that uh, both the Department of Historic Resources and Preservation Virginia will continue to champion as we 
um, look to the future. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Sonia Ingram, um, and she will introduce our panelists today. And I have to give a great shout out to Sonia. She has worked tirelessly to pull together the curriculum for Preservation Academy um, since its inception. And it's long and hard work. Um, so thank you, Sonia, and thank you for kicking us off today. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth and Julie, for that those introductions. Um, and thank you for everyone for joining us on this really important topic today. I will do a very brief introduction of our speakers. I'm just going to read their titles, but I want you to know that their full bios will be on our website. So if you want to know more about these great speakers, feel free to go to our website. Our first speaker is Natalie Henshaw. Natalie is the director of the Campaign for Historic Trades at Preservation Maryland. And our second speaker is David Stroud. And David is the director of Heritage Assets and the Historic Preservation Officer at Fort Monroe, Virginia. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Natalie and um, we'll let Natalie take it away. All right, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Sounds good. Excellent, all right. and. Um... I have a couple of foster kittens right now that have decided to get the zoomies and run around. And so if there's some crash banging, it is because of uh, kittens being playful in the back. <laughs> All right, and allow me to share my screen. All right. Okay. See it okay? All right. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So uh, my name is Natalie Henshaw, like I uh, was said, and I work with Preservation Maryland and direct the Campaign for Historic Trades. My background is various different stages in the preservation trades. I went to Savannah Technical College and got my associates in their program, and I worked through various different private and public sector positions with training. Um, ended up teaching in preservation trades, helping direct a community college program, teach at a community college program, and started my own uh, window restoration business in Savannah as well. And that was before working with Preservation Maryland. So I have a lot of different levels in this question of why is it hard to find historic trades people? Um, so that is essentially what we're gonna answer and what the campaign has addressed itself to figure out and help overcome. What is the Campaign for Historic Traits? It is a program of Preservation Maryland and it's a national program. Uh, it's workforce development initiative to expand and strengthen careers in the historic trades. We act as both a workforce development program and a workforce intermediary program. In development, we directly do the work. We figure out how to hire and train people, start up programs, start up educational. As an intermediary on the national level, we want to help facilitate that for others. So the things that we do, we want to help create models and then figure out how to export it so that other people can utilize them as well, like a catalyst. Preservation Maryland is a statewide nonprofit. It was founded in 1931. Um, we're focused on building a more equitable and sustainable future. We do it through strategic programming, workforce development being one of the bigger ones, but also affordable housing and climate change. The program was made possible through partnership with the Historic Preservation Training Center, the HPTC. I'll try not to do too many acronyms, hard work with national government sometimes, but. <laughs> Um, the HPTC is based in Frederick, Maryland, and was founded in 1977. It's a division of the National Park Service, but under, unlike other parks, it does not steward a specific site. It is a team of preservationists providing preservation services both to national park, other government agencies, and sometimes even private sector jobs. It's a fee-for-service model, and they have just a team of preservationists working on these factors. We created this partnership to help address the issue. What has been happening over time is that individual groups see the problem and work towards their own needs because that's their capacity. 
And they were doing that at HPTC with their own training programs, but realized that we need to address this at a larger scale because they can meet their own need, but that will be isolated and have low impact. How do we address this more broadly so that they don't have to keep funding it just for themselves and working to just sustain themselves? And such was born the campaign for historic trades. Our goals are to provide all tradespeople clear paths career pathways, accessible education, and secure employment. And we're doing this through seven major steps. One, register apprenticeships with the Department of Labor. Two, create open education training resources available online in English and Spanish. Three, work with stakeholders to support preservation trades programs, associations, and businesses. Four, develop statewide and national historic trades training opportunities accessible to everybody. Five, promote and recruit for the NPS preservation and trades programs. Six, advocate for historic trades training. And seven, lead the national movement to strengthen and expand historic trades careers. We came to these steps by first saying, why is this a problem? Where is it coming from? What are the issues? And how do we resolve them? The first step was even defining historic trades. So what does it mean, a historic trade? And what we came to were the skills needed to maintain, preserve, restore, rehabilitate, reconstruct, and deconstruct historic structures and places. And um, David will talk more about this later, but the Secretary of Interior Standards is what we're basing this on, and we're widening the scope a little bit. The Secretary of Interiors is about preservation, restoration, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. We also want to include the skills to maintain places and deconstruct them. So how do you address issues before they become a problem? And once something is at the end of its life cycle, how do we keep that historic fabric and document it in a way that aligns with our preservation ethos rather than just taking a wrecking ball to it. Those definitions, I'm sure we are probably all familiar, but if we go back to the National Historic Preservation Act, it was passed in 1966. And that's where a lot of this all stems from. And I want to highlight a particular part of it. But the NH or NHPA authorizes the Secretary of Interior to expand and maintain the National Register of Historic Places. The Minister Program of Direct Grants and preservation, for the Preservation of Properties included in the National Register, and to establish professional standards for the preservation of historic properties. Obviously a great act, but what was realized by the community right after was that we didn't have the skill sets to go forth with the act. It was a problem. We didn't have the people who could do what it charges it to do. In comes the Whitehill Report in 1968. The Whitehill Report defines the problem and recommends solutions. And this is over half a century ago. If you read the full report, it could have been written today. <laughs> so 50 years ago, they were saying that 40 years ago. So a century ago, most architects have been trained in grammar, historical styles, and draftsmanship. Older carpenters and masons were still familiar with the traditional techniques of their crafts. But the changing of the curricula in the 1930s, only the occasional architect has an interest in all of the, of the past. And with the rapidly changing techniques of the building trades, the ability to repair and reproduce details in old buildings has become extremely uncommon. They were saying this in 1968. The larger public and private organizations engaged in historic preservation, like the National Park Service in Colonial Williamsburg, had been forced to train and develop their own staffs of archaeologists, research historians, architects, and craftspeople. And these specialists normally fully occupied in the work of their organizations. So the number of professional restorationists available for general work is very small indeed. The pressing need to increase the numbers is the main problem that the Whitehill Report was addressing. They defined the problem and offered solutions. One of the main solutions was registering apprenticeships. The best method of training craftsperson is the oldest method, apprenticeship. And they very specifically said that 
preservation trades are a specialty within multiple trades. To do restoration masonry, you should be able to do masonry. To do restoration carpentry, you should be able to do carpentry. You need to have idea of how it's built in the full cycle, as well as the repair of it. There's the full report available at ptn.org if you want to read through it. There are lots of other recommendations that the preservation community committed itself to afterwards. This is a very incomplete timeline. There's lots that's missing. It's abbreviated. But one of the things was creating training centers that are regional um, educational resources that are standardized, obviously the apprenticeships as well, and working with modern trades. After the Whitehall re report was published, the preservation community, like I said, started to address some of these. Different trades started creating their trades associations, Mer our Artist Blacksmiths Association, the HPTC was founded, and the Secretary of Interior Standards, the first issue was published. And like I said, David will get into this more about what is really within the Secretary of Interior Standards. But that is what we have used to define the historic trades. Because the dilemma is that we have a multitude of trades. So how do you create a universal training ethos across all these different trades? And this is one of our preservation dilemmas. This is one of the fundamental reasons why it is so difficult. Historic trades are undefined occupations and encompass multiple specialty trades. Like I said, this is an incomplete list, but in the decades after the Whitehall Report, various trades associations were founded. The National Council for Preservation Education, um, one of the longest lasting community colleges, Belmont Community Colleges program was founded. The American College of Building Arts, Preservation Trades Network. All these different steps were taken and many were taken and many closed down. So what's missing from this list is all the different schools that have shuttered. One of the things we're undertaking is a landscape review of these programs. And we wanna catalog what has previously existed. Why did it close down? What was successful from it? And what can we replicate? And what should we not replicate in all of that? Even with all these efforts, if we go back to the National Historic Preservation Act, there are no professional qualification standards for historic tradespeople. There are for historic architects, um, architecture, pardon me, architectural historians, <laughs> historians, archeologists, but not the people actually touching the building. I can take a week in window workshop and call myself a window restoration expert. And that's the same as somebody who's been doing it for 30 years and there's no qualifying for that. And when I'm talking about an occupation, I am using Department of Labor terms. So this is the occupational definition from the Department of Labor about a carpenter. This is its occupational code. And within it, there are specialties. I can go to this website, learn about what a carpenter does, see the median wages, see the perspective of this job placement in the future. It's all studied by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Find how long does it take to be trained and where can I find training? We don't have that for a preservation carpenter. Obviously there are preservation carpenters working but it's not a defined occupation. Without an occupation, you can't have a profession. An occupation, definition, <laughs> the principal activity one engages in to earn money. Profession is an occupation requiring special knowledge or skill. And I think we all agree that preservation trades definitely require special knowledge or skill. But without that defined occupation, we don't have the structures in place to have professional associations that get us to where we need to go. And so when we create a profession, we need some of these things in place. And this is from the development of a profession, Lon Ferguson and James Ramsey. One is Professional qualifications. You need to establish a set of widely acceptable professional qualifications and observed by an accrediting organization, a set of educational outcomes applied universally, and they must demonstrate the competence. You think of most professions like doctors, lawyers, architects, archaeologists, all of these are in place for that. Same with trades, electricians, plumbers, uh, masons, with the masons or with the bricklayer and ally crafts people union. The other thing is barriers to entry. And I know we're talking about how to expand this and make it more um, accessible for people. 
And that's not what this is talking about is keeping people from trying, but you can't let everybody just say they're a window restoration expert. There has to be some type of barrier before you can call yourself that, a metric to discern the qualified from the unqualified. Professional associations, that is an element that exists as was seen on the timeline earlier. There are professional associations that can help tap into this. We need to get them lined up in what that preservation ethos means. So they provide networking, provide continuing education, um, and they help lobby for things that will help that association in that trade. And lastly is a code of ethics. If we go back to the window restoration uh, example again. <laughs> the Window Preservation Alliance exists as a 501c6. Code of ethics, um, something like I can't go out and hawk vinyl windows. <laughs> that would violate a code of ethics for what it means to be a historic window restoration specialist. So having those in place to help um, keep people on the same page, but also provide a means to uh, get people out of the profession, like you see, again, with doctors and lawyers. So this is our problem. Great to talk about it. What do you do about it? There's been lots of talk. And what we have committed ourselves is figuring out what does that mean in execution? How do we actually go about resolving these issues? The campaign has premised a lot of its work on a policy statement in 2020 by the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. It convened the Traditional Trades Training Task Force, ETTTF, to revisit the Whitehill Report, assess where we're at, and what does it mean going forward? And there are four major buckets that we have committed ourselves to working towards. Over here is our recommendation from the ACHP training. There should be national and regional trade, traditional trades training opportunities with a variety of options and pathways for different educational levels to maximize the number of new workers in the field. So tradespeople already working so they can add traditional trades and craftspeople already in the traditional trades to have continuing education opportunities. In execution, we are creating pre-apprenticeship programs those will register towards an apprenticeship program and give time. We wanna develop new ones, but we also wanna promote existing ones and map it out. What does it mean to do a three week program versus a six month? How does that all add up on this career journey? We're also creating continuing education classes and workshops. So how can we keep people in the field up to date, but also how do we work with other industries, allied, um, and modern construction to incorporate this preservation training. A second recommendation is curriculum. Each traditional trades training program currently has to create its own curriculum. It reinvents the wheel, and if an open education resource were available, it wouldn't have to keep doing that. It would also help standardize, make it more sustainable, and give it a lot more, um, give an anchor for new instructors coming in that they can pull from. To that end, we've hired a curriculum developer to create open education resources. We're working with existing partners to bring them into the fold of what all this means, standardizing the curriculum and compiling these learning resources, but we're also gonna host it online. We're getting a lot of this translated from English to Spanish and vice versa with some of our partners. And we're hosting it under a Creative Commons license. A lot of this is key as well as making it 508 compliant. If a community college was to start up, because there is federal money involved through the Department of Education, it has to be 508 compliant and cannot violate copyright. When we make this Creative Commons license, it is open for people to utilize and not monetize, so they can't take it and make a book and then sell it, but they can utilize it for their classes. And with it being 508 compliant, they can host it online. It's a lot of work to get this up to speed. So by having it ready to go, it eliminates a lot of duplicative work. The other recommendation was registering apprenticeships and we are registering apprenticeships. And I'm going to get into what that really means in functionality. So apprenticeships, a lot of these exist currently that are not registered by the Department of Labor. So when we're talking about apprenticeships, we mean ones registered with the Department of Labor. So like Colonial Williamsburg has a very robust process of apprenticeships and training people for their own staff. Um, 
with the ones registered by the Department of Labor, it functions as, um, I guess there's different roles within it. So the Department of Labor oversees and um, is the accrediting body for the certification. You have your employer, the apprenticeship sponsor, and the apprentice. The employer and sponsor can overlap. They don't always. In these, the campaign will be the sponsor. We want to work with employers and get them in touch with apprentices. The employers will intake the apprentices and pay them at a certain rate specified by these apprenticeships um, in incremental tiers. And they have to upgrade as they learn more and become a more valuable employee. As the sponsor, we will monitor their progress through, report to the Department of Labor, and make sure that they get the related instruction required of the apprenticeship. We'll also work with employers to make sure that these apprenticeships are designed to meet their needs. So are these people being trained up in what is needed for their position and their job? What we're working on now is a preservation technician, preservation carpenter, historic window technician, historic roofer, and a deconstruction technician. These are laid out like this. Each of these positions will have a work process schedule and the title, maintenance repair, this is one of the examples, and an occupational code. By registering these as an apprenticeship, we will create the occupational code. And beyond just having it in the system, this is really important for businesses. In my window restoration business, I am tax, local tax as a um, remodeler, which if you think about what that all goes into, we just do windows, but that's people who redo kitchens and bathrooms too. It's very different in the amount of work, the type of work and the risk of the work, but we get taxed in the same bracket. For my liability insurance, I am a handy person. And then for workers comp, it's a mess. <laughs> And there is a spectrum of what can be charged. I know some window people that get charged at like $10 for every $100 they earn. We were getting quotes for $30 for every $100 earned. Already, like I say, we can't afford ourselves. I couldn't hire me to do my windows. If we add in those type of things, it eliminates our ability to work on essentially most residential jobs and only towards commercial. So there are a lot of consequences by not having these occupational codes that we can rely on for things like insurance and tax reasons. And by having it, we can lobby more specifically. So the Window Preservation Alliance with an occupational code could work with an insurance group to get rates that actually match what is being done, laid out in these apprenticeships. These tell how long it takes. This one is 2,000 to 4,000 hours. 2,000 is per year, essentially, so about two years. And it specifies what actually happens on the job, this on-the-job learning. They're expected to spend 125 to 250 hours on maintenance procedures, safety training, hazardous material abatement, fire prevention, and building codes. That is the number of hours on the job they should be working on these different functions. In addition to the on-the-job competencies, they have related instruction. So if you are working with lead and asbestos, you need to learn about them and learn about the laws. That's what you would do in related instruction. And that is 144 hours for every 2000 hours minimum. It can be more. So what we have laid out are those on the job competencies matched up with position descriptions. And we're working with existing education programs to be the providers of that related instruction. So people could still go to college and get their degree by going through these apprenticeships, but also by us hosting some of that curriculum, if they have no interest or the inability to go, they can still get the related instruction components. Going back to the policy statement, and I'll wrap up here soon. I know I'm getting close to time, but we're very close. <laughs> um, the last part is the credentials. So one of the recommendations in the policy statement is there has to be some type of credentialing organization. If the job doesn't require you to be credentialed, then what is the point of trying to get the credentials? Plumbers get it, not only because it's good to know, but because they're required. Same with electricians, same with architects. We need a system of actually requiring people to do it. Otherwise, anybody can take a window workshop and say they're a window restoration expert. By registering these apprenticeships, we will create these professional qualification standards as they are laid out similarly with the National Park Service for those positions I mentioned earlier. Bring all back around to the National Historic Preservation Act. 
So if we're saying it takes four years, 8,000 hours to be a preservation carpenter, a professional qualification standard can say 8,000 hours on preservation carpentry related projects and um, 600 hours of related instruction. And it doesn't have to be accredited, it, has, it doesn't have to be degree based, but it gives us that need to say, this is what we say is a classified journey worker. This is somebody who can work independently and train new people in the field. To that end, it's really important that we work with employers on that because ultimately it has to be economically viable and match what is actually happening in the field. So by registering an apprenticeship, we create an occupation. From the occupation, we can create a profession. We're creating a directory of apprenticeship qualifying employers. To have an apprentice, you have to have somebody who's a journey worker. So what employers have those journey workers and can hire apprentices? It'll be really important to have that list so we can match people up. Also working with them to make sure the apprenticeships meet their industry needs. We're working on studies to create these data-driven solutions. Very recently, we published our um, historic trade labor analysis because what we're finding is we don't actually know how many people are working on historic buildings in the country at all or what those jobs are. So we did a study and found out that there's over 20,000 electricians working on historic buildings. So what we're pursuing now is how do we work with IBEW to create a preservation certificate? We don't need electricians as preservationists, but having some of them trained in preservation would be a huge boon because so many are actually working on these historic buildings. We're also developing instructor training coursework. So one of the issues is we need people to be able to train. Teaching is a different skill set than trades work. So we need to train tradespeople in education. By doing so, they can train more people. Right now we have this funnel idea, or pardon me, a pipeline idea. We need to start thinking as a funnel and exponentially. One qualified teacher can train a lot of people. So this brings me to the very end. I'm sorry, I know I'm a little bit over, but what we have is a workforce funnel. So when we're talking about the magnitude of what we need, this really um, visualizes it. We want a journey worker. Typically, one journey worker comes from four people starting an apprenticeship. Of the four that start an apprenticeship, only one will make it through on average. <laughs> to get into an apprenticeship, 16 people need to be in a pre-apprenticeship program. Of the 16 that make it through that, only four will go on to an apprenticeship. To even get into a pre-apprenticeship, we have to have people who are engaged, who have been to a class, been to a workshop, know somebody who is in it, know have family member that was in it. So 64. And above that is even career awareness. Even knowing that preservation carpentry is an option, we need 256 people to be aware of it as an option to end up with one journey worker. And so when we talk about these different programs, it's really important to say, what level is this? What does it prepare people for? Who do we need to actually cater this to to get them through this funnel? All right. So what we're trying to do, like I said, as an intermediary, we're building out these apprenticeships. We want to make it so everybody can use it. We're always still trying to make these actionable items. We're all talking about this. What can you do about it? So we have a monthly talking trades call. People can come on and talk about how programs function, what they want to do, talk with other people. It's an open call with different people and provide some networking. We have a monthly newsletter and social media where we update a lot of these things and there is resources like our labor study. We're also hosting and convening in June, the American Historic Trade Summit, to work through a lot of these things and have sessions on what does it mean to have a program? How do you start it up? We also built out the website to be aggregating. So we have spots where people can add information. I can't know everything. Other people know a lot. We wanna get that information into a hub. We have an opportunities page where you can submit events, jobs, resources, networks page, um, and a training and education page. Tell us if you know of things and we can add it to the list and direct people to there. And when people are interested in these careers, direct them to the page and we can get them where they need to be on that funnel. We also really need to connect with preservation trades employers. So any of the employers that might be interested, we really want to get them on board for hiring apprentices. And also once we get our open education resources online, use it. <laughs> Going to be there for you to utilize and use for your programs as well as startup guides. Um, and we'll have legislation that we're going to try and promote and make it uh, 
able to go to other states and advocacy kits for such. All right, I went over, I'm so sorry, I tried to keep it tight. <laughs> I will pass it on to David to talk about Secretary of Interior Standards. Thank you, David. Great, thank you so much, Natalie. Go ahead, David. Thank you, I'm just trying to pull the page up now. Can everyone see that? Looks good. Very good. So my name is uh, David Stroud. Thank you for being here today. And thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Sonia. As Sonia mentioned, my name is David Stroud. I'm the Director of Heritage Assets and the Historic Preservation Officer at Fort Monroe. I received a degree in Historic Preservation from the Savannah College of Art and Design. And for the last 30 years, I've worked in preservation construction throughout the US. Today, I will spend a few moments to briefly touch on some of the potential resources that owners can utilize in the preservation of their historic properties. With, with there currently being such a gap in preservation trades, it is more important than ever to educate owners in the care of their historic properties. I often say that education is one of the most essential aspects of historic preservation, whether you are the owner, contractor, code officials, uh, specialty trades, because having a better understanding of why we should preserve these historic properties gets all involved in a sense of pride and ownership in the work they do and rehabilitation or repair of a historic property. Again, in the following slides, I will briefly touch on just a few of the resources and insights that may assist owners of historic properties. First, I will speak to a few of the guiding resources the National Park Service has offered us. To owners of historic properties. Technical Preservation Services of the National Park Service provides guiding documents to assist owners in obtaining information on the subjects of historic preservation, rehabilitation, and restoration of historic structures. So I will describe just a few of the NPS guiding documents uh, in the following slides. So the standards for the treatment of historic properties address these the four treatments, preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction. As stated in the regulation, one set of standards will apply to a property undergoing treatment, depending on the property significance, its existing physical condition, the extent of documentation available, and interpretive goals when applicable. The standards will be applied taking into consideration the economic and technical feasibility of each project. These standards apply not only to historic buildings, but also to a wide variety of historic resource types eligible to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places. I'll briefly review the standards. The standards for rehabilitation provide direction in making appropriate choices in planning, the repairs, alterations, and additions that may be part of a rehabilitation project. The following standards shown here are to be applied to specific rehabilitation projects in a reasonable manner, taking into consideration the economic and technical feasibility. Uh, a few of these, uh, for instance, uh, one, a property shall be used for its historic purpose or be placed in new use that requires minimal change to the defining characteristics of the building and its site and environment. Two, the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided. Three, each property shall be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. Changes that create a false sense of historical development, such as adding conjectural features or architectural elements from other buildings, shall not be undertaken. For most properties change over time, those changes that have acquired historic significance in their own right shall be retained and preserved. Uh, distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a historic property shall be preserved as well. Deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced, where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature. The new features shall match the old in design color, texture, and other visual qualities where possible. And where possible, materials replacement of missing features shall be substantiated by doc 
documentary and physical or pictorial evidence, and we'll get into that a little later. Chemical or physical treatments such as sandblasting that causes damage to historic materials should not be used. Uh, the surface cleaning of structures, if appropriate, shall be undertaken using, using the gentlest means uh, possible. Uh, there are a number of uh, materials out there that uh, we find to be, or I find to be suitable for the treatment of, of, of buildings. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there. Significant archaeological resources affected by a project shall be protected and preserved. If such resources must be disturbed, mitigation measures shall be undertaken. And nine, uh, new additions, exterior alterations, or related new constructions shall not destroy historic materials that characterize the property. The new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing, size, scale, and architectural features that protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. And finally, 10, new additions and a an adjacent or related new construction shall be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. We'll next touch on the treatment, uh, the four treatments. Uh, the first is there are four sections within the guidelines, each focusing on one of the four treatment standards, preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction. Each section includes one set of standards with accompanying guidelines that are to be used throughout the course of a project. The first of these treatments we'll talk about is preservation. Preservation is defined as the act or process applying measures necessary to sustain the existing form, integrity, and materials of the historic property. Work including preliminary measures to protect and stabilize the property generally focuses upon ongoing maintenance and repair of historic materials and features rather than its rather than extensive replacement and new construction. The limited and sensitive upgrading of mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems and other code requiring work to make properties functional is, is appropriate within a preservation project. However, new Exterior additions are not within the scope of this treatment. The standards for pre preservation require retention of the greatest amount of historic fabric along with the building's historic form. The second treatment is rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is defined as the act process of making possible compatible use for a property through repair, alteration, and additions while preserving those portions and features which convey its historical, cultural, and architectural value. The rehabilitation standards acknowledge the need to alter and or add to a historic building to meet continuing new uses while retaining the building's historic character. The next is reconstruction, or excuse me, restoration. As you will see, this is defined as the act or process of accurately dep depicting the form, features, and character of a property as it appeared at a particular period of time by means of the removal of features from other periods in its history and, re and reconstruction of missing features from the restoration period, the limited and sensitive upgrading of mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems and other code required work to make properties functional is appropriate within a restoration project. The restoration standards allow for the depiction of a building and at a particular time in its history by preserving materials, features, finishes, and spaces from its period of significance and removing those from other periods. And finally, reconstruction. Reconstruction is defined as the act or process of depicting by means of new construction the form, features, and detailing of a non-surviving site, landscape, building, structure, or object for the purpose of replicating its appearance at a specific period of time and in its historic location. The reconstruction standards establish a limited framework for recreating a vanished or non-surviving building with new materials, primarily from for interpretive purposes. Next, I will briefly touch on a few NPS publications that provide guidance to the owners of historic properties. Here we see an example of window guidelines for rehabilitations from the guidelines for preserving, rehabilitating, restoring, and reconstructing historic buildings. The guidelines provide owners with recommended and not recommended practices when it involves the treatment of historic properties. The Secretary of Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties 
are regulatory only for projects receiving the historic preservation fund grant assistance and other federally assisted projects. Otherwise, these guidelines are intended to provide general guidance for work on any historic building and to promote best practices in preservation. Another useful publication are the preservation briefs, which provide further guidance on preserving, rehabilitating, restoring historic buildings. There are currently 50 preservation briefs. These publications help historic building owners recognize and resolve common problems prior to beginning work. The briefs are especially useful to historic preservation tax center programs applicants because they recommend methods and approaches for rehabilitating historic buildings that are consistent with their historic character. Here at Fort Monroe, I try to, my methodology for educating the public and contractors who do work at Fort Monroe is I make sure that all of the scopes of work that have a preservation brief, I make sure that they have a copy of that brief uh, and that they understand the, the work that's within the brief and the reasoning behind the brief. So the briefs are a, are a good way to get into the public domain with regards to teaching people uh, why we preserve uh, on a daily basis. The goal of the guidelines, another another useful, especially here at Fort Monroe, the goal of the guidelines on floor plane adapta flood adaptation for re rehabilitating historic buildings is to provide information about how to adapt historic buildings to be more resilient to flooding risk in the manner that will preserve their historic character. And while doing so, remaining consistent with the guidance provided with the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. For those of us, like I said, who are stewards of cultural resources within flood prone areas, these guidelines play a key role in our daily planning. This, you'll, this is an example of a, of a home in uh, Gwens Island, Virginia. Uh, while not fully in a floodplain, uh, these guidelines were applied to this structure in its rehabilitation. Here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we are fortunate to have the Virginia Department of Historic Resource, Resources, which acts as the State Historic Preservation Office. The mission of the DHR is to foster, encourage, and support stewardship of Virginia's significant historic architectural, archaeological, and cultural resources. The DHR provides a broad range of assistance to owners to include historic tax credit administration, guidance in archaeological undertakings, as well as provides an ever-evolving list of historic trades and consultants. All states have some form of state level office, such as the DHR, that encourages and promotes to continue preservation of cultural resources. Next, I will briefly highlight the process in which an owner of their or their consultants and or architects would need to follow in order to pursue historic tax credits for their rehabilitation. However, further guidance should be sought from DHR staff uh, while in the very early stages of planning for rehabilitation that we'll be considering the use of historic tax credits. Here I've shown a copy of the cover pages for both the tax credit application checklist as well as the part one evaluation of significance. The part one is the first document that you will need to provide to the DHR. The document is called the evaluation of significance. It is used to ensure that your historic rehabilitation project is eligible for the tax credit program. The first step is to complete the part one application and send all part one materials noted on the checklist to the DHR. If you intend to also apply for a federal credit as well as the state credit, your, your initial application should also include two copies of the federal form, which can be obtained on the National Park Service website. Once submitted, the perfect DHR tax credit staff will contact you about moving forward. An owner would typically proceed with the part two description of rehabilitation once it has been confirmed that the property is indeed considered eligible based on a review of the part one evaluation of significance. The part two application re requests certification that the proposed rehabil rehabilitation work appears to be consistent with the standards as previously discussed. Part two will require the most work by the owner or their consultants. 
This phase of the process requires a description of each significant architectural feature of the property and requires a clearly detailed description of the scope of work for each of those elements that will be treated in a proposed rehabilitation. Many property owners can and do choose to complete the part two themselves using the available sample narrative description of work, which is available through the DHR webpage. However, hiring a professional consultant or experienced licensed architect in who is experienced with historic preservation and the tax credit process to assist in the completion of the required forms oftentimes makes the process less cumbersome. This process also requires that the owner and or consultants provide existing conditions images showing areas and elements where significant work is to occur. These images are to be linked to a photo key on a floor plan of the structure. And this illustrates the this part two description of proposed rehabilitation. This, this what I've highlighted in red illustrates a typical. This is the example you'll find on the DHR website. This this is a typical example of a window uh, feature as a feature uh, from 1890. This is a description of the existing conditions, and then this is a description of the proposed uh, work to be performed to the window or windows. And that would all be included in the narrative description. In the process of developing a rehabilitation plan for the part two, primary and secondary research should play a significant role in any successful rehabilitation and can be, and can be performed by owners, their consultants or architects. While I've illustrated images of contemporary editions of pattern books here, readily available modern reproductions of these books can be used in the in the reestablishment or repair of lost or severely damaged historic architectural elements. Owners, the architects and or consultants can get a sense of the way a particular element was designed, crafted, installed, and at times what material it was, it may have been produced in. Using source materials such as this in combination with evidence that remains helps to inform as to the original intent of the builder and in the end greatly improves the owner's ability to successfully re rehabilitate lost elements of the structure. Information such as this should be provided in a part two application. In this slide, I've indicated two, two plates out of uh, one of Asher Benjamin's uh, book. Asher Benjamin was not, is known as the first American architect, uh, mainly working in the first quarter of the 19th century. Here I've provided an example and I've just grabbed one a project that I did uh, years ago. Uh, this was the recreation of lost elements. Both of these uh, porch elements in their balustrade had, had become lost over the years. So based on physical evidence on the site and then additional evidence of uh, millwork that was extant, uh, I produced a set of drawings and then had these reconstructed. This was not a tax credit project, by the way, but the, the threshold was still maintained for, as if it were a tax credit project. And finally, we will touch on the process certification. The part three application requests certification that the completed work is consistent with the secretary standards. Photographs showing the completed work must accompany the part three. All part three applications must have an independent certified public accountant. Review. The expenses incurred during the totality of the rehabilitation and must be submitted with required financial reports. All expenses should be tracked and categorized, categorized as eligible or ineligible expenses. Further guidance on what are considered eligible or ineligible expenses can be found on the DHL website. However, it is a good rule of thumb to identify such expenses early on in preliminary budgets and then track and record those Cost throughout the rehabilitation project. This makes for a smoother audit in the end when engaging an independent CPA. Once all documents have been gathered and reviewed by CPA, the financial report must then be submitted with part three application. To claim the, to claim the state credit, the taxpayer must complete the state schedule CR and attach, attach a copy of the certification of completed work letter provided by the Department of Social Resources. The federal credit is claimed on IRS Form 3468. Our, the IRS requires information related to the substantial rehabilitation test and a copy of certification of the completed work by the Secretary of Interior. 
Again, if you have any questions related to this process, please reach out to the DHR. They'll be happy to help you work your way through that. Typically, another thing to consider is typically cities have a designated historic district. Also, districts also have part of their zoning ordinance, design guidelines, design guidelines for those structures within a designated historic district. These design guidelines are often required to be followed by any undertaking and is typically submitted to an architectural review board for review and approval during the building permit process. Most, of, most often these design guidelines and reviews are for exterior effects to historic structures only, and at times also have prescribed color palettes that must be adhered to within the district. The design guidelines are more often times than not in line with the Secretary of Interior standards that were discussed earlier. The district's zoning office may also have the ability to provide guidance and perhaps also a list of historic trades consultants and contractors that generally work within the district. As a general rule, however, the list of consultants and contractors cannot be individually recommended and the providers of such lists do not do, do so with the understanding that they do not accept responsibility for the performance of any contractor or consultant. The list do, however, give owners an opportunity to begin vetting the vetting process in the early stages of a project design. Within the Virginia existing building code, a historic building is defined as a building or structure that is one or more of the following listed or certified as eligible for listing by a state historic preservation officer or the keeper of the National Register of Historic Places in the National Register in the National Register of Historic Places. Designated as a historic as historic under applicable state and local law or certified as a certified uh, contributing resource within the National Register, state designated or locally designated historic district. I will briefly discuss an example on the following slide that will illustrate the importance of knowing how to apply the appropriate building code. Why is this important? It is important that owners and their consultants as well as the architects understand that certain building codes that are required for new construction have the potential to have an adverse effect on character finding elements of a historic structure. Certain codes for new construction do not have to be applied to historic structures as defined in the DEBC. This is generally the rule throughout the US dependent on the localities adopted building codes, but for the most part, they are derived from the 2018 International Building Code. Over the years, it has been my practice to meet with local building officials in the early project planning stages to ensure that everyone involved in rehabilitation is aware of the intent of the scope of the rehabilitation as well as what codes will be applied. As you will see in the image provided, the existing 18th century stair balustrade is perhaps slightly lower than required for new residential construction as outlined in the 2018 Virginia Residential Building Code. Also, another frequent issue that comes up is that the tread sizes, riser heights, and distance between balusters are often insufficient for the new building code. These existing conditions are addressed, are typically allowed in the 2018 Virginia existing building code. However, one must keep in mind that if the rehabilitation design calls for change of occupancy, a local code official would potentially need to grant an alternative configuration or issue an exemption due to the change of occupancy or use. Again, for these reasons, I personally find a walkthrough with a local code official to be a very important part of rehabilitation during the planning stages. And finally, we will end my presentation on media sources. There are, but, there are but a few, if any, TV shows that are dedicated to true preservation or rehabilitation of historic properties. There are a number of shows that seem to promote preservation, which is good. However, most shows are for entertainment purposes only and are not sufficient nor well-focused enough to provide accurate preservation or rehabilitation guidance. Shows in the past were somewhat better than today and shows based in the UK are typically better sources for illustrating the means and methods utilized in historic preservation. YouTube also has countless videos which illustrate and describe means and methods utilized in preservation. These videos can be a valuable source in illustrating a particular method that perhaps will lead to improved skills, material fabrication, and in the end, inspiration. 
In general, the one should watch all of these shows or videos as entertainment and then confirm aspects of what was illustrated with the standards discussed earlier and the localities of the system building code and or ordinance. One recent example of why these shows must be taken with a grain of salt was demonstrated on a long-running old house show. In that show, the original grand balustrade was determined to not be within modern building code. Due to its, due to its being low, the handrail being lower than allowed uh, by code. As a result, the TV show's presenter and builder removed the historic balustrade, reconfigured it in such a way as to raise the height of the handrail, thus greatly diminishing the integrity of a character defining the element of the historic structure, which leads me back to the previous discussion with regard to existing building codes. I hope this has helped enlighten a few of you on with regards to what you can do yourself. Uh, this concludes my portion of the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, David and Natalie. Before we get into the questions, we do have a few questions. Before we get into those, I want to make sure that everyone is aware that we have shared in the chat a few links. And one of that, one of those is to DHR's consultants list. Another one is to Preservation Maryland's Campaign for Historic Trades Labor Study. <laughs> Um, and lastly, uh, we have a link to Preservation Virginia's Restoration Crew. Um, I just wanted to mention that we, uh, we meant to have a video of some of our Restoration Crew members as part of this webinar, but unfortunately the, um, the video quality did not turn out quite as good as we had wanted. But I am going to put these links in here for everyone. And I, I'll go ahead and start with a couple of questions. I know that we are running a little bit over, but um, one of the questions that I that we received, and, and I'm just going to open this to Natalie and David um, and whoever would like to answer. But one of the questions is: um, We are a nonprofit affordable housing developer, and we rehab historic homes. Because we are developing affordable housing, we received HUD funding which requires that we take the lowest bid for our rehabs. We were told by our HUD officers that we could use a construction matrix to help give weight to contractors in experience with preservation. Could you recommend any criteria to include in this matrix that would help ensure the competent contractor and experience in preservation? So I'll just open that up to Natalie. It looks like you're, you're uh, maybe had some experience in that. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, um, especially going through lead safe training. They make a very big distinction with HUD. And um, we were working on an estimate for a HUD project too that was just, um, it's a lot to it. I, and I wonder what they might be looking for in terms of the matrix and experience. My thought is a lot of people will say they have experience and it doesn't mean it's quality experience or correct experience. So my thought would go to, um, if they can provide in advance a scope or maybe a sample of a scope of work that they have previously executed and how it matches up with the Secretary of Interior standards. Because just saying I have experience on this building, it can be bad experience. <laughs> and I think also to that end of who is actually on the staff. So I've been on crews before where maybe the person who is bidding the job has the qualifications, but not the people executing the jobs. So I don't know if that would be allowable, but those are my two thoughts of like, how do you measure both the experience and the quality of experience and who is gonna be working on the job? Um, do you have any experience, David, or thoughts too on that? Um, I don't have much experience with HUD and HUD finance, you know, that we've talked with uh, a few redevelopment groups here at Fort Monroe, um, not for in, uh, low income housing, uh, however, but uh, Julie, I think uh, the Lorton project, I think they got HUD financing uh, some years ago. I did talk to them about it. I guess my mind goes, being that my, my background is construction, my mind goes to what was the bid document like? How was it structured? Was what were the specifications? Uh, because 
depending on how the, the documents are developed and how they are drawn uh, and how they're specified, really, that takes a lot of the people out who aren't qualified, right? And so my mind always goes back because when I when I develop drawings, I think of that drawing as a contract document. So when I go to contract with somebody, that becomes the document that's part of the contract. And so you can reference back to that drawing. And if someone is not performing per that drawing, then they are in breach of the contract, of the construction contract. And so it's, it's harder to manage than what I just said. Uh, but having a background in construction for as long as I have, that's always that has always been my safety net was a contract document. Um, and then my experience uh, before coming to Fort Monroe, and I'm starting to develop uh, the same mentality, although this is a, a, a public uh, entity, so I can't do it what, the way I used to do it. But as a contractor in preservation, I would get subcontractors that I, uh, I worked with quite a bit and I trusted, and I just kept them and uh, I negotiated prices with them. Um, and it worked out well and it, uh, I could control how things process. But when you put something to bid like that, unless like Natalie said, unless we have some some means of qualifying their abilities, uh, be that from past work, uh, past projects. Uh, it's, we have a bit of the same problem in the Commonwealth with uh, the procurement process. Uh, so I understand the issue, but again, I would go back to the, the, the document that's being bid. That's your first line of defense in my opinion. Right. I have another uh, much more broad question. Um, I am a home homeowner in the Northern Neck and I cannot find anyone who understands how to work on historic homes in our, for our local historic district. What do you suggest is my first ask, thing to go to? And I know that's a little bit more broad and maybe, I don't know, maybe Julie, you could, Chime in. I know that DHR has a consultants list. We do, and it would give you some names of people to reach out to. And then we would always encourage you to ask for references and maybe to speak to clients who have used that person before. Um, I would ask my friends. That's what I do when I need somebody. Um, ask around and see who has a name that they would recommend because they have personal firsthand knowledge of the person's abilities. But there isn't one place to go that you're guaranteed of finding uh, a qualified person that I'm aware of. Maybe Natalie knows something different. <laughs> so I would, I would, I mean, in the Northern Neck, I mean, there are a few historic house museums in the Northern Neck, and there's an abundance of historic properties. So I would ask around and see who had, has had the best experience. Uh, Stratford Hall's up there. Uh, they have their own team to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, I would ask around. There's a lot of opportunities uh, for people to uh, work on historic houses up there. And it's a small community. So if, if somebody's not uh, towing the line, you'll know about it. Mm -hmm. I would offer also the advice that if you do identify somebody who gets really good um, recommendations from people and they tell you, well, I can't get to you for six months or a year, those people are worth waiting for. And you may just have to wait that long. And yeah, I'm, that was a good point, Julie. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. And I will add to David and I were talking the other day that a lot of people who are working on historic houses sort of have their own crew. And, you know, rightly so, they are, uh, they like to keep that crew sort of close to themselves. They, <laughs> you know, because they have a lot of work to do. But um, if you could, just talk to other people who are working on historic houses, then they are gonna be able to help you and um, in this aspect. So um, two more quick questions and another broad question. If you are a young person just starting out and you're interested in getting into the preservation trades field, where would the first place be to look for training? On the job. Um, I'll say that's what we're trying to make our website. Um, 
I was that young person that didn't know how to get in. And so my mind was immediately school and it got me leads in, but without connections to jobs and particularly being a non-traditional person in construction, um, I don't know if I would have gotten jobs without that. So it, I had moments where I was like, this is good, I'm going, but I'm also paying to do work that people are being paid to do. <laughs> um, so I definitely agree with David, like really the, what needs to happen is on the job learning and we just need more systems in place to get there. But particularly like career switchers and people don't know, I think volunteer opportunities are really a great way to do it. We have our website mapped out to, are you new? How do you get in? What are the ways to do it? And then finding those actual tangible opportunities, classes and workshops too, things that get you engaged to see like, do you like working with your hands? Um, can you be outside? Do you actually hate ladders? Maybe you shouldn't be a roofer. Um, you know, a lot of those are kind of important questions to address before you make a leap. Yeah, so it's been my experience over the years that, um, you know, obviously there was there was no opportunity. Uh, when I went to college and, and studied historic preservation, it was more about preservation compliance and architectural history. There was very little hands-on with regards to that. But as I went to school with my construction background, I was working as a preservation carpenter and in Savannah, Georgia. So as I would go to class, my professor would say, David, what did you do today? And I would tell the class and he said, well, that's good. We'll talk about that for the rest of the day. Now you go home and rest because you've done preservation all day. And so that's, it was really on the job training. Uh, and so when I started hiring people in the construction company, um, I would tell them that, you know, it, I can hire a good, if you, if you have the hand skills, if you're a good carpenter, or you're a good mason, we can turn you into a good preservationist because it, it's really getting into the why are you doing it? Because the first thing you really need are the hand, uh, the hand skills, right? You, you, you want to, you, you want to have you want to have to use your hands, right? You want to be in the field. You want to you know be on the job site. So that's the first step. And it's like uh, contractors. Uh, contractors become contractors because they probably started out as an apprentice carpenter, and they worked in the field long enough to get the skills to get the contractor's license and then become a contractor. And the same thing really works in preservation. If you want to be a preservation contractor. Start as you know, someone as digging digging foundations around historic houses to to put in a, a drain systems and then work your way up. Watch what the superintendent does. Watch what the carpenter does. You know, you you eventually work your way up through the process through the the guild system of construction, and you'll find yourself one day having the ability to be a preservation uh, contractor. Uh, now, if there's training, and I know there's trade schools out there that are coming up, that would be the first place I would go if I was a young person. Uh, it's it, it provides you all of that in one neat package rather than kind of journeyman-like uh, doing work uh, throughout the country. Right. I know that we're running out of time. Um, I just want to mention that if your question has not been answered, everyone will receive an email with all the questions and answers, as well as a link to the recording of the webinar. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and for all the speakers. And I just the lastly want to, I'm gonna include in the chat a link to our upcoming webinars. I highly recommend you check those out. And um, I guess with that, we'll just end the webinar, but thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much.